Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm doing something a bit different. Rather than responding to an apologist, I'm going to go through an argument for God and give my thoughts on that particular argument. If you guys are interested, I'll turn this into a series and go through a bunch of different arguments. I hope you like it because I'm starting with my least favorite argument in order to just get it out of the way, and it would kind of suck to put a bunch of effort into a video about it only to never make it past that argument in the series. Anyway, today we're doing the ontological argument, so let's go! This is my least favorite argument because it's one of the hardest to follow, depending on how it's formulated. All of the versions essentially work by defining God into existence with various appeals. There are seven or eight categories of ontological arguments depending on how we're counting, each with their own subcategories, but they all come back to how God is defined, whether it be a maximal being, a perfect being, a necessary being, etc. Only one of the eight categories is called the definitional category, but they do all essentially come back to how one defines God. And the eighth category, Hegelian, is not really fully fleshed out. Hegel died before he finished his book on the subject, so we never got to see a proper formulation with premises leading to a conclusion, and so are left guessing at how he might have formulated it based on his previous works. So let's just give a quick breeze through these various categories and see what they offer. Category 1, as mentioned, are the definitional ontological arguments. Essentially, God is defined as a being that has every perfection. Existence is a quality that would be included in having every perfection. Therefore, God exists. This basically just breaks down into if we define God as existing, then God exists. The premise begs the question and provides no justification for accepting it as a sound argument. Not only is this not a sound argument, but the jump from by definition God is an existent being to God exists is invalid. In formal logic, an argument is valid if the truth of the premises necessarily lead to the conclusion, so if it is possible for the conclusion to be false while the premises remain true, it is logically invalid. A sound argument is one where not only is it valid, but the premises are actually true. So, for instance, if I make an argument that goes premise 1, Vice Rhino either uses a GoXLR or a Rodecaster Pro as his audio interface. Premise 2, Vice Rhino does not use the GoXLR. Conclusion, therefore Vice Rhino uses the Rodecaster Pro. This is a perfectly valid argument because if all the premises are actually true, it is impossible for the conclusion to be false. However, it is not a sound argument because there are more potential audio interfaces than just the two listed. I actually use the Zoom PodTrack P8. So by virtue of the fact that a human defining a term does not necessarily mean that the thing being defined actually exists, this means that this version of the argument doesn't even cross the very low bar into logical validity, much less logical soundness. There is no reason to think that our defining a being as having every perfection would necessarily result in that being also having existence. Category 2 are the conceptual ontological arguments. I can conceive of a being of maximal greatness. If a being of maximal greatness does not exist, then I can conceive of a being greater than that being, namely an identical being that does exist, and I cannot conceive of a being greater than this extant maximal being. Therefore, this extant maximal being exists. Now, of course, as with all the versions of the ontological argument, this one relies on a definition of God, in this case a maximal being. What does it mean to be a maximal being? What is a maximal quality? Maximal to whose perspective? Maybe if a god exists, he would get bored after an eternity of existence, and so would decide that non-existence is a more maximal quality than existence, and so if this is the case, then a maximal being does not exist because it would have decided to end its existence by definition. Can't you see, Captain? For us, the disease is immortality. Not only does this fail on the definitional side of things, this argument also adds to the concept of defining God into existence the idea of human conception. I can conceive of a maximal being, therefore such a being must exist. 
How arrogant does one have to be to assume that their ability to conceive of things means that those things must exist in reality? This is a version that is often responded to by rephrasing the argument to be a maximally great something else. I can conceive of the maximally great pizza, and maximal greatness in this case means that it has the ideal topping combination for everyone's preferences and never runs out of slices, among other qualities. The maximally great pizza that doesn't exist would not be as maximally great as a pizza that does exist. Therefore, the maximally great pizza exists. But of course this all relies on human conception apparently, so what about a time when no being existed who could conceive of a maximally great anything, pizza, being, or otherwise? Chimpanzees don't spend their time thinking about a maximally great chimpanzee, and there was a time in the history of the Earth when no being with humanity's cognitive abilities existed, so nobody could conceive of a maximally great being to begin with. What then are the implications for that maximally great being? If you want God to be intrinsically real, linking him with our ability to conceptualize him is not really a good idea. Now we come to the modal ontological argument. Modal logic is basically logic that is concerned with things being possible and or necessary. So for this one we imagine possible worlds, hypothetical realities that do not match up with actual reality but are possible. In some possible worlds, I do use the Rodecaster Pro instead of the PodTrack P8 as my audio interface. I don't do that in the real world, but it's not like there's a law of physics or something that gets broken by making this one change to reality, and something is necessary if it is not possible for it to not be true in all possible worlds. And there are different categories of necessity, so for this instance, the laws of physics might be a physical necessity. It may not be possible for them to be different. The modal ontological argument takes many forms, but the one I'm most familiar with is Plantinga's version, which again builds on top of the definitional version. In this version, it is possible that God exists. If it is possible that God exists, then God exists in some possible worlds. If God exists in some possible worlds, then God exists in all possible worlds. If God exists in all possible worlds, then God exists in the actual world. If God exists in the actual world, then God exists. So in this case, we are defining God as a necessary being. It is blatantly circular. If we define God as being necessary, then God is necessary, and since necessary beings exist in all possible worlds, including the actual world, then God exists. On top of that, the first premise, that is, it is possible that God exists, is a pure assumption. I don't know enough about the universe, reality, and whatever may be beyond reality to be able to state categorically whether or not the existence of God is possible. It is an unknown at this time, so I see no reason to just grant the assumption that it's possible that God exists. But this version could also be flipped on its head. Essentially, it's saying that God exists in at least one possible world, and God exists in all possible worlds if God exists in any. By that same reasoning, one could say that God fails to exist in at least one possible world, and God exists in all possible worlds if God exists in any, therefore God does not exist. But of course, all of my objections to this argument in general apply equally to the reverse of this argument, so I am fully willing to admit that this reversal doesn't really work, because the argument it's based on doesn't work. Next up we have the Mignonian argument. This one essentially says the if g is f, where f is a quality and g is the thing that that quality has, is always true. So for instance, if f is the color purple and g is a crayon, then the purple crayon is purple is a true statement. So this then gets applied to God as a perfect being. The existent perfect being is existent. This of course is entirely circular. Sure, if a god exists, then the statement will be true, but you can't just assume that a god exists in the statement as part of an argument. And it's very easy to show that the fg is f is not always a true statement. The square circle is square is formulated that way, but it is quite obviously not a true statement, because you cannot have a square circle. Shut up non-Euclidean proponents, you know I'm not talking about that. Substitute whatever shape you fancy that would demonstrate my point if you like. And, of course, there has been philosophical discussion as to what vocabulary this sort of argumentation applies to, but that doesn't amount to much more than special pleading. So to figure out which words can fit into this argument, think of a set of things that exist and a set of things that don't exist. For instance, an audio interface, a microphone, and a computer are all things that exist. Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, and our square circle do not exist. It will only be possible to formulate the statement in a way that is not true with regards to things that do not exist. 
which of course kind of kills the argument. The existent Easter Bunny is existent is a non-true statement, so clearly existence is not a word which works in the statement the FG is F. Somewhat important to note here, though, is that the argument has fallen out of favor with modern philosophers, so it's not likely that you'll encounter this one in the wild. The next one, we're on number five now if you're counting, is the experiential ontological argument, and there's really not much to it. It goes roughly, the word God has meaning that is revealed in religious experience. The word God has meaning only if God exists. Hence, God exists. So essentially, the word God only has meaning to those who have had experiences with God, which really isn't an argument so much as an assertion. After all, the only thing we have to go on here is the personal experience of the people who supposedly had these experiences with God. So to the rest of us, the word God continues to not have meaning. Number six is the Mariological argument. It essentially states that I exist, therefore something exists, and where stuff exists, the Mariological sum of that stuff also exists. Therefore, the sum of all things exists, therefore God, which is defined as the sum of all things, exists. A Mariological sum is essentially the idea that when two or more physical objects exist, they make up a whole that consists of all of them, which is not quite the same as a set. A set is a group of objects whose members share some characteristic or other, whereas a Mariological sum of spatial objects is itself a larger spatial object. At best, this version of the argument gets you to the existence of the physical universe and just calls that God. whoop de doo Category 7 are the higher order ontological arguments, which pile definitional assumptions on top of each other in order to reach God. A God property is a property possessed by God in all possible worlds where God exists. Not all properties are God properties, and any property made up entirely of other God properties is itself a God property. The properties being claimed vary slightly from version to version, but usually they include necessary existence, omnipotence, omniscience, and perfect goodness. Therefore, a necessarily extant, omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly good being exists. And this being is God. In addition to just assuming things into existence, this version of the argument adds on the difficulty that is the fact that the triomnies are internally inconsistent and contradictory. It brings up the problem of evil. An all-powerful, perfectly good being would not create a universe where evil exists. Evil exists, therefore an all-powerful, perfectly good being does not. An omniscient god will also lack free will. God knows exactly what he will do in advance, and knows exactly what all the outcomes from that action will be. And since he knows it in advance, he will not be free to do otherwise when the time comes. And can God really be said to be omnipotent if he does not have the power to make decisions other than the ones he knew in advance that he would make? Free will is also often employed as a solution to the problem of evil. God is giving us the choice to do good or bad, and if we were compelled to do good at all times, that would not be truly good. Well, if God knows all of his choices in advance and is not free to do otherwise, he can no longer be said to be perfectly good, as he is being forced by his omniscience to be perfectly good. So if God is omniscient, he cannot also be omnipotent and perfectly good. And if God is perfectly good, he cannot be omnipotent because perfect goodness would preclude the ability to do anything even slightly less than morally perfect. Omnipotence would include the ability to behave less than morally perfect. Forget the conundrum of whether or not God could make a rock so heavy that he cannot lift it. That just warrants a redefinition of omnipotent to be the ability to do anything that is logically possible, which has its own problems, but there's nothing inherent Apparently illogical about God doing immoral things. So God's inability to do immoral things means that he cannot be omnipotent. Of course, this is all kind of a moot point when we get to specific God claims. I mostly deal with people who believe in the God of the Bible, and if you read the Bible, you can find several instances of God engaging in immoral activity. I'd actually wager that it's easier to find God behaving immorally in the Bible than morally. I mean, the book of Job all by itself is 2.3% of the word count of the Bible, and that whole book is a story of God being immoral, having been convinced by Satan to torture a guy just so that he can say, see, this guy is super loyal to me no matter what you have me do to him. And yeah, you'll hear people talk about Satan having done those things to Job, but the book is quite clear that Satan merely incited God to do those things to Job. 
Now, like I said at the beginning, when we break down the ontological arguments, they usually end up being an attempt to define God into existence, and often make use of question-begging, where the conclusion of the argument is assumed in one or more of the premises. But as I alluded to earlier, there are also a myriad of problems with the various definitions that are given to God. God is a being which has every perfection, for instance. Perfection is a rather subjective metric. The perfect cup of tea, in my opinion, is a loose-leaf cream of Earl Grey that is steeped at 90 degrees Celsius for four minutes with just a bit of milk. Someone else might consider chamomile to be the perfect cup of tea steeped at 80 degrees for six minutes. There is no objective solution to this. Both of us are correct for our own preferences. God has every perfection. Every perfect quality is something that he has. So God is a cup of Earl Grey tea made with my specifications. Okay, that actually tracks. Tea is God confirmed. But then by that definition, God is also the perfect butt plug, and the perfect movie, and the perfect stick of RAM with the perfect amount of RGB. Oh, and you know that feeling you get when you're just a little bit bloated, but you let out the perfect fart that is just amazingly satisfying? That's the God fart. Okay, so maybe perfect doesn't work because it's just too darn subjective. How about maximally great? This really suffers from the same problem. What does it mean to be maximally great? One of my favorite counters to the maximally great version of the argument is that maximal greatness would include the ability to do maximally impressive things. The creation of the universe is more impressive if the being that created the universe has a handicap of some sort. And the greater the handicap, the more impressive the creation of the universe is. Not existing would be the greatest handicap, therefore a maximally great being does not exist. This line of thinking is not without its problems, but as per usual with these parody rephrasings of the various ontological arguments, the problems with this argument are born from the fact that the argument it is parodying is fundamentally flawed. But yeah, what characteristics make up maximally great are entirely arbitrary, just as with perfect. Honorable mention at this point goes to Gödel's ontological argument. This one was developed by Kurt Gödel in his private notebooks, but was not published until after his death, and it's a bit more in-depth than the others. It starts off with three definitions. Definition one is that X is godlike if and only if X has as essential properties those and only those properties which are positive. Definition two, A is an essence of X if and only if for every property of B, X has B necessarily if and only if A entails B. That one's a little tricky to wrap your mind around, so let's rephrase it for clarity. Any property of X which entails all of the necessary properties of X, and only the necessary properties of X, is essential to X. Definition three is that X necessarily exists if and only if every essence of X is necessarily exemplified, or necessary existence of an individual is the necessary exemplification of all of its essences. From there we can move on to the axioms, or the starting assumptions of the argument for which proofs will not be offered. Axiom 1. If a property is positive, then its negation is not positive. Axiom 2. Any property that is strictly implied by a positive property is positive. Axiom 3. The property of being godlike is positive. Axiom 4. If a property is positive, then it is necessarily positive. Axiom 5. Necessary existence is positive. Axiom 6, for any property P, if P is positive, then being necessarily P is positive. The axioms are where the main problems of this argument lie, but before dealing with that, let's finish the argument. Theorem 1, if a property is positive, then it is consistent. Corollary 1, the property of being godlike is consistent. Theorem 2, if something is godlike, then the property of being godlike is an essence of that thing. Theorem 3, necessarily the property of being godlike is exemplified. In other words, something godlike necessarily exists. So to rephrase this to be a bit more clear, something is godlike if it has every positive property. It is possible that something exists that has every positive property. If a property is positive, then adding the characteristic of necessity to that property is also positive. If a property is good, then it is necessarily good, and so anything godlike will necessarily possess every positive property. Necessary existence is a positive property, and therefore would be possessed by something godlike, therefore something godlike necessarily exists. To borrow a rephrasing from someone explaining this argument on the Math Stack Exchange, it is possible that something godlike exists, so it's possible that it's necessary for something godlike to exist, and so it is in fact necessary for something godlike to exist. 
The keen-eyed masochists among you might have recognized this argument from the tail end of Brian Holdsworth's Mathematical Proof of God's Existence video, in which he spent almost ten minutes explaining how he's kinda salty that people actually expected to find some sort of argument for God in his video titled Undeniable Proof of God's Existence, in which he didn't actually provide any evidence or arguments for God, and then he ranted about how, fine, he'll give proof this time, but you're too intellectually deficient to properly understand it. So. If you think you find some flaw in it, just know that you're wrong. And then he quickly flashed Girdle's mathematical formulation of the ontological argument across the screen in ten seconds with zero explanation and ended the video. Now, he was correct when he said that the logic of the argument holds. If all the definitions and axioms are accepted, then the conclusion logically follows. But unfortunately, the definitions and axioms have some pretty large flaws. For one, no definition of positive is given for positive properties, aside from being the opposite of a negative property. So this brings it back into the realm of subjectivity. Some would consider an object that fits perfectly into the human anus to be a positive property. By the logic of this argument, this would mean that necessarily fitting perfectly into the human anus is also a positive property, and a godlike being necessarily has all positive properties. So this godlike being that exists necessarily fits perfectly into the human anus. And if you have a problem with that, then you disagree with Axiom 4, that if a property is positive, then it is necessarily positive. Because many people would agree that fitting perfectly into the human anus is a positive property, which, according to this axiom, makes it a necessarily positive property. But then we get to Axiom 5. Necessary existence is positive. As I pointed out earlier, it is entirely possible that an omni-being such as God would get bored with existence and so would eventually decide to cease existing, which would make non-existence the positive property in that case. And while this video is not specific about the Christian God, but rather the God concept in general, since I mostly deal with Christian apologists, I would just like to take a moment to point out that the Bible explicitly says that, at least for humans, it is better to not exist than to exist. Which, according to this argument, would mean that non-existence is a positive property, which would mean that non-existence is a necessarily positive property, which would mean that a godlike being would necessarily not exist. So basically my main problems with this argument are axioms 4 and 5, as well as the lack of a definition of positive. There are more problems with the argument, but those are the three main problems in my opinion. So yeah, those are my thoughts on the various forms of the ontological argument. Of course, most of the versions I presented were simplified, and I'm sure there will be people who claim that it was my simplification of the arguments that introduced the errors, but these are all problems that have been pointed out by many respected philosophers over the years, like Kant, Hume, and Oppie, among others. My simplification was to help make these arguments easier to understand. One of the reasons they are my least favorite category of arguments is because they are often made much more complicated than they need to be, and so can appear impressive and daunting at first glance, but when you take the time to learn what they're actually saying, it turns out to not be much of anything. They all essentially break down to, if I define God as existing, then God exists. It's a big tautological nothing burger. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from... Fuck you, I'm not telling you who it's from. Normally I don't censor the names, but this comment seems to be an attempt at shameless self-promotion, and I refuse to reward that sort of behavior. So this person says, I offer every flat earther that can explain the observations that I made in my video. Stars don't lie on the flat earth from a flat earth point of view, and that can show me one and only one observation or experiment that proves a flat earth that I can't explain from the globe. One thousand dollars, so I will send you or any other flat earther one thousand dollars when he or she can do the things that I described above. The video is on my channel. The challenge ends June 30th, 2021. Now, I don't even know what this person means by stars don't lie on the flat earth from a flat earth point of view, but what I've gathered from this is that this person has offered to pay $1,000 to any flat earther who can provide evidence of a flat earth that is not adequately accounted for by a globe earth. I made it my comment of the day because of the curious inclusion of the phrase you or any other flat earther. Do they think I'm a flat earther? Why would you think that I'm a flat earther? Or did you maybe just find the one video on my channel that is even tangentially related to flat earth and just assume without watching the video that I am a flat earther and are trolling for channel views? Is the you perhaps directed at other people watching my video? I don't know, this one's kind of hard to decipher.
Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the essence of X. If for every property of my channel B, X has B necessarily, and I've lost track of where I'm going with this. If you'd like me to lose track of you, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!